The early hours of the 23rd of February 1939 were bitterly cold. Residents in surrounding apartments by Midville Road in Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, woke to the strong scent of smoke coming from a second and third floor apartment, home to 42-year-old World War I veteran Harold Bard, 38-year-old Josephine Bard, the couple's nine-year-old daughter Joan Carolyn Bard, who was staying with relatives that night, and their German shepherd. The fire department successfully extinguished the fire, however, Harold and Josephine, along with their faithful dog, did not survive. The circumstances surrounding the incident were shrouded in mystery. Harold was found on the floor, with the telephone gripped in his hand and his wife, Josephine, was sitting on a chair. Both had allegedly died due to smoke inhalation. Arthur Hamilton, a neighbour of the family who spoke to the Boston Globe, stated, One of the most unusual things about that fire was the dog they found. The Bards had a huge German Shepherd police dog, and he used to bark whenever anyone went near to the apartment. But after the smoke had cleared and firemen were poking through the ruins, they found the dog wrapped up in a blanket in the basement. It appeared that someone had put him to sleep before the fire started. The Bard's dog was very well known in the community, and witnesses confirmed he had been strangely quiet that evening. There is little information about whether there was an inquiry into the Bard's deaths, however one fact was certain. Joan Bard was suddenly an orphan. In a bizarre twist, in the early 1960s, Joan disappeared in mysterious circumstances, leaving her husband and two children behind. Joan was born on the 12th of May 1930 in Brooklyn, New York. Not much information is known about her early life, however, following the suspicious fire when she was nine years old, she lived with a foster family and went on to adopt their surname, going by Joan Natras. She had two foster brothers and one foster sister. There were rumours that she told an acquaintance that she had suffered abuse at the hands of her foster father. In 1952, she graduated from Wilson College in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania with a bachelor's degree in English literature. She met Martin Donald Risch, a Harvard business graduate at a football match, both of them immediately getting along as they realised that they were both born in Brooklyn. And on the 26th of December 1955, the couple married in Huntington, Long Island, moving into a simple yet cosy Brooklyn Heights apartment the following month. Martin was employed at the Regal Paper Company in New York, and Joan worked as a secretary at Thomas Y. Crowell & Co. Publishing Company. In the years following their marriage, the Rishes welcomed two children, Lillian and David, in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and in April of 1961, the family moved to a home on Old Bedford Road, Lincoln, in the suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. Whilst living in Lincoln, Martin Risch worked as a Fitchburg Paper Company executive, whilst Joan stayed at home to look after the children and complete household tasks. She was a popular member of the community. She was actively involved in the League of Women Voters and made it known to friends that she wanted to one day become a teacher once Lillian and David were older. Joan was described as an intelligent, friendly, generous and responsible woman who was devoted to her loved ones, but a few neighbours and friends described her as being unfulfilled. It was the 24th of October 1961 and was, by all accounts, an ordinary autumn day. Martin Risch awoke early to prepare for an overnight business trip to New York City. He left the family home at 6.50am and headed to Logan Airport for his flight, which was due to depart at 8am. 
31-year-old Joan woke up, made breakfast for the children and continued with her usual morning routine. She spoke to the bin collector, the letter carrier and delivery boys, all of whom thought she seemed to be in good spirits and they did not notice anything different about Joan that morning. Taking Lillian with her and dropping her son off with a neighbour, Joan visited the dentist to have a cavity filled and also made a follow-up appointment. She bought $15 worth of groceries at the supermarket and then returned home in her blue Chevrolet sedan. She then made lunch at approximately 11am, put David to sleep in his cot at midday and let Lillian play outside. At some point between 11.15 and 11.45 a.m., a delivery driver for a dry cleaning service arrived at the house to pick up several of Martin's suits. At 1.55 p.m., Joan told her daughter that she was going out. Joan accompanied Lillian across to a swing set belonging to the parents of Douglas Barker, a neighbour's son of whom Lillian was friends with. Joan then returned home alone. Neighbours witnessed Joan wearing a trench coat, mowing the lawn outside of her home at 2pm. At 2.15pm, Barbara Barker, the mother of Douglas, saw Joan standing beside her Chevrolet, looking dazed and holding something red in her arms. Barbara assumed she was playing a game with the children. At 3.20pm, another witness, Virginia Keane, recalled seeing an unfamiliar grey or blue 1954 or 55 Oldsmobile parked behind Joan's vehicle in the driveway. Police made an effort to find this car but were unsuccessful, despite another neighbour who said that they had seen the Oldsmobile parked in the driveway multiple times during August and September, having made note of three digits of the licence plate. Nobody reported seeing the vehicle entering or leaving Old Bedford Road. At 4pm, Lillian Risch left the Barker residence and returned home. However, after a few minutes, she ran back to the Barkers, explaining that her mother was missing, her little brother was crying in his crib and there was red paint on the kitchen walls and floor. Barbara Barker went over to the house and what she saw sent chills down her spine. Police were notified at 4.33pm and arrived at the Risch home five minutes later. From David's room on the first floor to the kitchen, in the master bedroom and the carpeted stairs, there were spots and smears of this red paint, which was confirmed as being blood and type O, the same as Joan Risch. There was said to have not been a huge amount of blood around a pint, but it was enough to be consistent with either a nosebleed or a head wound. The kitchen was left in a state of disarray, with a chair or table being overturned. Sources differ on that fact. And the telephone had been ripped from the wall, sitting in a bin which had been moved from beneath the kitchen sink to the centre of the floor. It had blood in the dialing holes and traces of Joan's blood were also found trailing outside and on the trunk and hood of her car. On the phone mount, police found a bloody fingerprint and there were two further single fingerprints and a partial palm print on the kitchen wall. However, the individual whose prints they were has never been identified. Some other prints were identified as Jones, despite the police having never recorded her fingerprints until a while later. Local men, as well as tradesmen and delivery men, offered their prints to authorities, but no match was made. Footprints were absent at the scene, but paper towels and a pair of David's coveralls had appeared to have been used in an attempt to clean up the blood, and the telephone book was found opened at the emergency number section, which was actually absent of any numbers written on the pages. And in 1961, 911 was not in operation as an emergency number. None of the locks on the doors had been tampered with and there was no evidence suggesting a robbery. Massachusetts State Police called hospitals in the area to see whether a woman matching Joan's description had checked in, but they were unsuccessful in the search. 
On initial investigation, police deduced that, contrary to the evidence, Joan was surprised by an intruder and tried to call for help, quickly looking for an emergency number to call. However, she was then struck on the head by the perpetrator. One blood spatter was found so highly on the wall, police were stated as saying that Joan had attempted to climb the wall because she was so terrified. Police believed that Joan was victim to a sex maniac and had been abducted, as they believed the blood evidence was not enough to indicate murder by stabbing or gunshot wound. Martin Risch was notified of his wife's disappearance at 7pm that evening and rushed home. Trying to find any clues, Martin found Joan's trench coat, her handbag and some cash. However, he stated to police that an address book, which Joan wrote various appointments in, a grey top coat and her day clothes were missing. Empty beer bottles were found in the kitchen bin, but Martin had no idea where they had come from. Police initially had suspicions about Martin and whether his marriage was as wonderful as he had made it out to be. Friends, relatives, school officials, former employers and maternity personnel from Lincoln and Ridgefield and other places Joan lived in life were able to support Martin's claim and state she had no emotional problems or domestic issues. Woodland, marshes, ponds and ditches were searched, as well as garages and abandoned buildings. However, Joan was nowhere to be found. A neighbour, George Robichaud, received a mysterious phone call from an excited woman, who stated that she couldn't get through to anyone in the Rish household before abruptly hanging up. A Bedford motel owner told authorities that at 4pm on the day Rish vanished, a nervous woman checked in under the name Patricia Richardson. However, what was quite unusual to the owner was that she carried no luggage or even a handbag with her. Her writing on the register was described as shaky, and upon seeing the writing for himself, Martin Rish was not certain if the handwriting was that of his wife. At 2.45pm, a woman wearing a handkerchief over her head was seen shuffling north of the parkway in Lincoln, hunched over, looking cold and dishevelled. A cab driver in Cambridge recalled picking up a woman matching Joan's description. The unidentified woman appeared to be confused and repeatedly changed her destination on the journey. She paid the driver $5 from which she took from a little paper bag she had with her. A young intern in Stoneham Hospital, Massachusetts, reported that Rish was a patient of his, but bizarrely, the patient was not the missing woman, but another woman of the same name who had recently married. On route 2A, a motorist reported seeing a female hitchhiker around the time Joan disappeared, and another driver reportedly witnessed a woman matching the 31-year-old's description walking along route 128 in Waltham near Cambridge Reservoir, approximately five miles from the Rish residence. The woman seemed disorientated. She apparently had swollen legs with blood or mud running down them and was clutching her stomach. Nobody stopped to help her. The reservoir was searched but nothing of any significance was recovered. It is possible that she may have fallen into a pit along the route which was under construction at the time, however the area has never been excavated. Blood samples from the kitchen were sent to Harvard Medical School for further examination and the findings indicated that the blood was consistent with menstruation. It was also stated that Joan may have suffered a sudden haemorrhage which could have resulted in amnesia. As soon as this information was made public in the media, whispers of a miscarriage or abortion became rife. It was theorised that Joan may have suffered a miscarriage and had subsequently run away to start a new life with a lover. Joan could possibly have had an at-home abortion which was botched. Abortion was very much a taboo subject at the time and was deemed a criminal offence. Lincoln residents told police that on several occasions they had been asked by an unknown man about the whereabouts of Joan Risch. 
A woman reportedly received a phone call from an unidentified individual who asked to speak to Joan. Another woman stated that a man had approached her in the street asking to see Joan Risch. Another said that Joan was absent from the family home for two hours the day before she disappeared and police were unable to find out where she was, what she was doing or who she was possibly with. Joan could have been the victim of a stalker. A neighbour allegedly heard the garage doors at the Rish house open and close at odd hours of the night, which brought about another chilling theory that someone could have been living in the Rish home without anyone noticing. Perhaps the person was living in the garage, which actually had a large window with full view of the interior of the house. Perhaps the perpetrator crept into the kitchen through the front door when Joan was mowing the lawn. One man who was seen as potentially being a suspect in Rish's disappearance was 47-year-old Howard Cooper, who was a fugitive from the law when she vanished. He had twice been committed to a mental hospital in Texas after being charged twice with assault with intent to kill. A man matching Cooper's description was seen working at a restaurant in Lincoln and was never seen again after Joan's disappearance. In the weeks and months leading up to Joan Rish's disappearance, she had visited the local library on a weekly basis and had taken out at least 25 books. Of the books she checked out of the library, they included Death of the Heart, which had a striking plot of an orphan girl who disappeared. Other titles she read were Into Thin Air, which told the story of a married actress who vanished, leaving a towel and bloodstains behind as clues. Mostly Murder, which discussed numerous murders and disappearances. The Screaming Rabbit, a mystery book with vanishing as a theme, the 27th Wife, a biography of a married woman who disappeared. Incense to Idols, the plot of which involved a woman who fled Paris to begin life anew in New Zealand. The Hunt for Richard Thorpe, which tells the tale of a boy who disappears of his own accord and a book he read is a vital clue to the mystery. And finally, the very last book she took out was a biography about Mary Queen of Scots. Martin Risch expressed that he was aware of Joan's love for literature, however he believed she was a fan of the suspense genre and had no clue about her interest in unsolved disappearances and murders. Martin Risch, the delivery men, postman, milkman and dry cleaner were all cleared of any involvement in Joan's vanishing. Martin Risch strongly believed that Joan would never have abandoned her children to start a new life. He firmly opposed the theory that his wife was involved in some sort of accident and suffered from memory loss as a result, wandering into the woods and succumbing to the elements. He stated that Joan was more than likely abducted and then murdered, despite his insistence that she had no enemies. Joan was declared legally dead in 1975 and although Martin moved out of the family home, he settled into a house nearby. He never lost hope that Joan was alive somewhere. Martin lived the rest of his life never knowing what happened to his wife and passed away in 2009. Five weeks after Joan Risch disappeared, an anonymous donor left a potted plant on the Risch's doorstep, something which was seen as significant as shortly before Joan had vanished, someone had left geranium plants for her. At the time of her disappearance, Joan Risch was 31 years old, Caucasian, had dark brown hair and pale blue eyes. She was 5 feet 7 inches tall and weighed approximately 120 pounds or 54 kilograms. She was wearing a grey cloth coat of possibly the Peck and Peck brand, a white blouse, a jumper, a charcoal coloured woolen skirt, blue shoes with white piping, although some sources stated black shoes, and wore a slim platinum wedding ring with five diamonds. She has a filling in her upper left molar and her ears are pierced. 
The disappearance of Joan Risch is one of the strangest and most bizarre disappearances to have taken place in the United States of America and is a very well-known case among professional and amateur sleuths. With no apparent trouble in her relationships, no money problems or obvious signs of emotional turmoil, the reasons for Joan's disappearance have been widely debated with numerous theories about what fate befell her. Did she leave of her own accord and plan her disappearance? Did she dream of starting life anew, like in the books she was so passionate about? Was the unidentified individual who was at the house someone that she knew and trusted? And was she having an affair? If she was pregnant, was the child her husband's? Who was the woman wandering aimlessly on the highway with blood on her legs and cradling her stomach? A theory that is widely discussed is that Joan suffered either a miscarriage or had an abortion at home. The termination, which presumably took place in the master bedroom upstairs, went wrong and Joan went into a panic, went down to the kitchen and tried to call for help, but was stopped by whoever carried out the abortion, because if word got out that they were conducting illegal practices, he would have been stripped of his presumed medical licence and the pair would have more than likely been incarcerated. The abortionist may have carried Joan's body to his vehicle and driven off, perhaps dumping the body somewhere like a pit on the nearby construction site or abandoning her alive on the highway, disorientated and bleeding. Also an explanation for the beer bottles in the bin, which was a piece of evidence that perplexed many, was that during the 50s and 60s, beer or Guinness was given to patients in order to boost their iron levels. Therefore, it's entirely possible that this was the case with Joan. The last official investigators on the case died in 2009, and ever since, the case has remained cold. In the last few years, interest in Joan's disappearance has spiked enormously. However, the truth about what happened to Joan Risch remains a mystery.